Welcome, everybody. My name is Mina Jane, and I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library in Massachusetts. And I see people are already writing in the chat where they're coming from. So welcome. Um, I am thrilled to be here with Noah Charney and Noah Charney. <laughs> <laughs> nope, that was not a mistake. I'm not having a stroke. We have two Noah Charneys here to talk about their work, their books, their lives, how they intersect, how their lives have sort of intersected um, because they have the same name. So we're going to be talking with them in just a minute. But I do want to say a couple things. Thanks to the Friends of the Ashland Public Library for supporting all of our programming. Thank you to our Noahs who let me share this um, program with other libraries and a bunch of them jumped on because this is so unique and interesting and that's what libraries like and our, our patrons like that as well. So if you're from another library, welcome. And if you're in Ashland, you know how awesome this is gonna be. Um, you can buy signed books from our Noah's, um, from Banks, uh, I'm sorry, Aesop's Fables and I will put a link to that in the chat. So without too much further ado, I do wanna say that I um, reached out to both Noah's last year um, about doing two separate conversations. And then I started getting emails back from them. And I was like, who's writing to me? <laughs> I was like, uh, there's two of you. And so um, that's how the sort of the genesis. And then um, Art Noah, who is down um, in, in the black there, is um, did a presentation with us on his art history um, investigations and books. And it was just fabulous. And we started talking about ecology, Noah, and we were like, we have to do this. So here we are. Um, welcome, Noah and Noah. And um, I know you want to talk a little bit about yourselves first, and then we're going to do a quick presentation from each of our Noahs. And then they're going to talk about their intersectionality, and then we're going to have a Q&A. So um, let's go. Uh, I guess I'll just introduce myself first. I'm Noah Charney. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's an honor to be on stage with the other Noah Charney. He's uh, maybe more famous. He has, you know, he's been on fresh air, for God's sake. People are always like saying, hey, I heard you. And like, no, you, you heard the other one. But um, I always like to say I'm at least the original one because I was born on November 26, 1979. And you were born on November 27th, 1979, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, so our college applications, as we were talking about, have gotten mixed up and and I they once tried to give me your prescription at Walgreens. Um, I didn't take it, but I think I don't know what it was. Um, and we first met as we were talking about you emailed me in college. You were coming to my college for a, a squash tournament. Right. And mm -hmm. and you're like, we must meet. And we had this brief, awkward interaction like you're Noah. I'm Noah. I think your mom was there. <laughs> I don't know what else happened, but uh, and at the time I was studying physics. I was shooting lasers at electrons in the physics lab, and and that uh, I sort of I liked the science and that kind of stuff, but I really wanted to be outside, playing with nature, playing with animals, and so I from my physics undergrad I went on to sort of study ecology and, and natural history, and ended up now I'm at the University of Maine as assistant professor of conservation biology. Uh, where it turns out ecology is mostly inside writing models and staring at computers and not actually getting outside. Um, but, you know, I write papers about uh, climate change and amphibian conservation and things that are meant for other academics to read. Uh, and uh, But my students, my grad students get to go outside playing with amphibians and they get to go uh, swamping, going through the swamp and all that kind of stuff. And I get to teach uh, uh, these field courses, which are really fun. Um, so for me, they let me outside some, and that's where I really like to be. And and I, I'll talk more about the book I wrote, which is sort of aside from academia, is is not is uh, about natural history and and some of my work there. But um, so I'll I'll let Noah, the other Noah, introduce himself. Thanks so much. This is really a thrill. It's a little bit like um like a some postmodern like uh, Borges short story, or somebody should make a being John Malkovich type of film about this. Um, we decided that uh, that we are probably related. We even look enough alike to think that we're from the same gene pool. Uh, there's one other Noah Charney, also born in 1979. Who knows if we're all related? Um, but yeah, it's um, very cool to be able to do an event with with uh, Noah Number One. I also got um, a note from his publicist at Yale University Press if I would blurb his new book, which I thought was stroke of genius. So it um, it sounds more pretentious than it is, but you have Noah Charney blurbing the new book by Noah Charney and saying how good it is. And it's a great book. I highly recommend it. He also wrote a book about tracking insects, which I remember seeing and thinking, I wish I had written that. That looks really cool. Um, so my my the, the version of, of Noah Charney um, that I embody is, is a professor of art history, specializing in art crime. 
Um, and I've written uh, loads of books now. We're past 20, and I also do TV presenting and radio presenting. Um, I'm from New Haven, Connecticut, um, but I live in Slovenia, believe it or not, and that's where I'm calling in from today. Um, and uh, the book I'm going to talk to you about briefly is a new one called The Thefts of the Mona Lisa. Um, and so most of my books are about art history or art crime, but I do some other little forays in other uh, fields like the book that came out before this one earlier this year is called The Slavic Myths. Um, and it's about um, Slavic myths and the Slavic pantheon, um, which is a world that I now uh, happily live in. I think Slovenia is a wonderful place. If you have any questions about that, we can talk about it. And that we were just discussing how I actually don't do tours, but there's one that I run a couple times a year for a company called Atlas Obscura that feels like the other Noah should be running it because it's about uh, forced to table foraging and it's wandering through the Alps and, and eating wild things and cooking wild things, which sounds like much more suited to his background. Um, but he's too super badass. Uh, he runs his own lab, which is like living the dream of every biology professor. So I'm excited to hear his story. So I'll pass the mic back to you. All right, thanks. I guess I'm gonna share my screen real quick and make sure this works. Um, let's see. Uh, can, every, can you see that other Noah? Yeah, looks good. Does ecology Noah? All right, good. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my book and, and my works. Uh, uh, so as I alluded to, you know, my relationship with academia is a little complicated. I think other no, you had something similar in grad school. You can correct me if I'm wrong, whereas we took a sort of left turn from the thesis we were supposed to be writing to write a book. Um, and uh, in my case, sort of against the advice of my mentors, I took a 40 day and 40 night road trip across the country. Um, and uh with my friend uh, Charlie Eisman to write uh, this book that uh, you alluded to there. Um, oh, I wrote one of these books. Um, did you guess which one? And it was a lot of fun uh, writing writing this book, the tracks and the sign of insects, and and uh, you know tracking like you know we're really into animal tracking, and we got into tracking bugs, looking at like the footprints and the silk and the, the poops and things they leave behind, and not and, like who did it, and also like. Uh, looking at these amazing artwork of the creation of these little critters was just a whole world we got into. And Charlie is still deep in that world doing all sorts of amazing things. Um, and so this sort of natural history writing, as I said, is sort of a little tangential to the ac academic papers I write, but I, I find them to be really rewarding and, and really fun and, and what I like um, the most. And so this is the, the new book that I've written that, that you blurbed here. Um, and I'll, I'll read your blurb here, which is, says, as an art historian, I'm used to reading paintings. Here, Noah Charney has provided a guide to reading landscapes, which is, you know, something I've thought about a little bit. Like, I'm into tracking landscapes. This is tracking animals, tracking bugs. And you're, you sort of look at paintings and track sort of like what it means there. And there's sort of this like obsession with like looking at the clues and figuring out, well, what does it mean? And who's behind the curtain and, and all that kind of stuff. And I, it'd be fun to talk about like why we're obsessed with that kind of thinking. Um, but uh, so this is this is the book I'll talk about for a little bit here. Um, so I want to start uh, just to give you some backdrop with uh, uh, Nashville, Tennessee, where I, where I grew up. Um, and around, I think, 2006 or so, I started a set of nonprofits. I think around the same time you were setting up your art crimes nonprofit. Um, and uh, in, in my case, uh, we are looking at the city of Nashville, which is one of the largest land area cities in the whole country of, or of the US. Um, and and uh, it has, I get the statistic wrong, I think it's something like 250 square miles of closed canopy forest within the metro limits. And we are looking at the conservation, uh, the conservation target areas and how to set up corridors linking them. Um, and this is the official open space plan adopted by the Metro Council. And right here is Richland Creek. I'm going to zoom in there. This is Richland Creek. This is what I call the Nido Bridgeway. Um, and when I was a kid, my mom would drive me home from school and, and we'd come down this way and I asked her to take the Nido Bridgeway shortcut, which would you used to be able to drive across this railroad here. You can see the road no longer connects. They made this a dead end. But you used to be able to drive across. We get there. She'd stop the car and I'd get out and she'd ask me to count how many turtles I could see from the bridge. And you know, I'd look over the edge and there'd be sometimes dozens of turtles, like box turtles, soft shell turtles, map turtles, turtles that are, 
you know, uh, today on the official list of those in greatest need of conservation in the state of Tennessee, a lot of cool species. It's one of my favorite wildlife viewing spots ever. So a few years ago, I went to take my kids back uh, to experience the sacred part of my childhood. And we found this sign. And I was like, what, what do you mean road closed? This is a public road. Um, and I did some digging and it turns out that the city of Nashville literally took this public road and gave it away to the two abutting rich landowners on either side for free. And, you know, this went through like five different committees twice, three different readings of council twice. Um, and apparently nowhere along the way did anybody sort of raise their hand and say like, wait a minute, uh, this isn't a good idea. You know, we've got conservationists fighting tooth and nail to protect spaces like this, and we're just going to give it away. Um, and I don't actually blame the people making these decisions. They're fine people. Some of them actually work with our nonprofit. They're well-intentioned. But the problem, one of the problems I see is that they're using maps that look like this. That's what they're given, these black and white plat maps that show sort of property ownership and things like traffic flow. And remember how this is a dead end road now. So from a traffic perspective, it has no value. It's a valueless road, sure, give it away. Um, and obviously what's missing is an awareness of like the ecological context, a relationship between the people making the decisions and the land and the ecosystems that are there being impacted. So increasingly we are disconnected from nature. Um, we let machines identify species for us and we don't have to think about what the thing is anymore. If we wanna get from point A to point B, we can't do it without having Google Maps tell us when to turn where and we don't even have a map in our head of how things are spatially related to each other. Um, and, you know, we don't even have to write anything anymore because ChatGPT can just do everything for us, um, which is really fun. And I use it all the time. Um, it's a useful tool, but it's also really terrifying. And the thing that terrifies me in part is the, it getting between us and our relationship with nature, which is something that I think the bots can't really replace. Um, so the thing, the job I liked the most that I ever had was teaching this course uh, where I would take the students out uh, once a week to meet a landscape and form a connection with it and relate to it and learn to read it. And so uh, that's what this book is about. It follows these this class through a bunch of different sites where we read the landscape. So what do I mean by reading a landscape? Um, essentially, you look for patterns and these patterns tell stories. So in, and I'll show you an example in, in our backyard here. If you look uh, throughout our backyard, um, there are hemlocks all throughout the understory, uh, but there are no hemlocks in the canopy. And this tells a this is a pattern tells a story, and I'll get back to it in a second. There's another pattern that tells a story, which is if you dig a hole anywhere in our yard, uh, it just keeps going through this nice soft soil that our garden loves. Um, but the thing is, you don't find any rocks. You you can't find a rock in our yard. But if you take a walk up the hill behind our house, within about 20 seconds, you start passing lots and lots of rocks. There are rocks everywhere. You, you can't avoid them. They're the footprints of the glaciers. Um, so uh, when the glaciers melted 10,000 years ago, they lost rocks all across the Northeast, which is why farmers you know, 200 years ago had to haul them out of their fields and line their fields with stone walls. So why aren't there rocks in our front yard? Well, um, when the glaciers melted in this region, it left behind this giant glacial lake. And our house must have been below lake level where for thousands of years, layer after layer of sediment built up uh, and covered these rocks. So we sit up on this hill and look out and imagine we're still looking over that giant glacial lake. We imagine our house is still beachfront property at the lake that's been gone for 10,000 years. Um, and when you look at those stone walls, you actually notice there are no small rocks in there, which suggests that this wasn't cropland, this was sheep pasture. And, you know, I would have done the same thing, keep the crops down in our lake bottom soil where our garden is right uh and put the sheep up here up in this rocky acidic soils where the you know there's partridge berries and pines and uh up here you actually have that same pattern of hemlocks all throughout the understory but no hemlocks in the canopy and this is the classic story of forest succession. So when the sheep pasture was abandoned, the winged pine seeds flew out across the fields and the pines grew up straight and tall. And pines, you know, they love the sun, but the thing is pines can't grow in the shade of their own canopy. Hemlocks, on the other hand, are slow growing and they love the shade. So they sit down there waiting for the pines to die, waiting to turn this into a hemlock forest. 
And there's this middle layer of these little birches next to these cut stumps that tell us that, you know, a couple decades ago, someone cut some of the pines, making gaps in the canopy where the birches love to grow. So all these layers, they tell us about the past. Uh, they tell us about the future. They tell us, you know, where to plant your garden and put your sheep, where to find the partridge berries, bobcats, fishers, porcupines, all those things. Um, and, uh, you know, they if we all had this sort of level of relationship with nature and the decision makers understood our lands that we're managing in this kind of way, I think we'd make better decisions. I also find this to be just a really compelling and fun way to tell stories and way to, co to connect uh, with the natural world. So in the lands that we live on, um, we control a whole like universe of species and, and ecosystems. And you know, we've heard about managing wild yards, probably a classic example of things you do in your yard is planting non-native shrubs potentially. And Desiree Narango has a great example of this. She studied neighborhoods in DC and looked at you know, places where there are more exotic shrubs planted and exotic shrubs have less bugs. And in those neighborhoods, she found that the chickadee mamas could not find enough bugs to feed their babies. So the chickadee babies died before they could get out of the nest. All sorts of rippling effects that, that we have on the world. So we, uh, we've heard about how you know, invasives are bad and non-native species, we should only be planting natives um, for one chapter in this book, you know, I, I spent the winter taking pictures of this one place, this abandoned orchard, and I was trying to get every species that lived there. Um, and this is one of these like totally invasive dominated, like there's privet, multifloral rose, bittersweet, all the things that are on the noxious weed list of things we most detest. And it's just a tangled mess there. And this whole winter, uh, there was this massive cleanup effort going on with the uh, uh, ground screws are cleaning out the shrubs and trying to make it pretty, get rid of the privet and bittersweet and rose and all that stuff. And um, at the same time, my heart kind of broke watching this cleanup effort because, you know, the orchard is a place that lives deep in me. For 11 winters, Charlie and I uh, taught this winter tracking course, and we would always start in the orchard for one particular species we were after. Now, when you visit the orchard, you'll find lots of what we call rabbitat. This is thick multiflora rose which has lots of Eastern cottontails living under it, eating it through winter. And Eastern cottontails, they're uh, imported from the Midwest. They're not a native species, but above them, there's uh, lots of berries and the birds like to hang out there and eat all the berries. And you get like this, like in the winter, this sort of cacophony of robins. And I remember one time we were teaching and Charlie was amidst this loud birds. He was talking about bird language, which is this idea that if you listen to the birds, they'll tell you things about what's going on in nature. And so, and, and just when he was saying this, suddenly the birds went quiet and this hush fell over the orchard. And we waited a minute. And then this Cooper talk comes gliding low overhead and he's like, aha, that's what the birds were telling us. So these shrubs, they feed the little bunnies and the little birds that feed the bigger birds and the predators. And we were out there trying to get pictures with our trail cameras of all the predators and on Christmas day, it snowed about, you know, yay much, a foot or so. And I went out there with uh, his son, Juno, who was, I think, probably four at the time. And his little legs were too short for the deep snow. And so I had to make the holes in the snow. And he was sort of stepping in my tracks and sort of the way coyotes will, you know, with their rear feet in their front tracks and this direct register to save energy. Um, and in fact, sometimes you'll follow a coyote trail and it'll suddenly branch out and you'll realize what you thought was one was three coyote trails. So Juno looks up to me and he's like, Tata, you and me, we're coyotes. And I'm like, yeah. And so we get up to the trail camera and I put my laptop down in the snow and take the SD card out of it and put it into the, the computer, expecting to see a picture of me and Juno walking up to the camera. But we don't. What we see is this picture. And on some level, we believe we actually transformed into that coyote and we howled the whole way back to the car. So Eastern coyote, they're a modern invention. They didn't exist a hundred years ago. They were sort of Western coyotes that filled the gap of wolves that we killed off and they interbred with wolves on the way. We caught red foxes on our camera there, also mostly imported from Europe for fox hunting. And we caught gray foxes, which are a fully native species. So when Charlie and I were teaching this class, we would of the tracking class, we would spend a lot of time out in the deep woods of Western Mass. If you've never been up there, there's amazing old forests. 
big. Um, and every once in a while, every few days, we would come across the tracks of a bobcat. And we'd be like, ah, our favorite species. Let's follow it. So we'd follow that trail. And almost every time, that bobcat would lead us to some horrible thicket, some old logging cut, some place that just was a tangle, a mess with lots of bunnies in it, some place like the orchard. And it's really bobcat is the reason we always start in the orchard, because it's the one place that we can always go and always find bobcat sign. It's the densest population of bobcats we've ever seen. And it may be that there's just one family of bobcats we've been following for 20 years. It's just that they have no reason to go anywhere else because they've got all they need in that thicket, the food and the shelter. So when you look at the orchard, maybe you see a tangled mess of invasives, or maybe you see the bobcats that you have a long relationship with. You know, a mile away from the orchard, there's this famous uh, salamander crossing spot where each uh, spring, the, this mass amphibian migration happens and the kids and the families come out to help the spotted salamanders across the road. Um, and uh, it's not like spotted salamanders are rare. There are probably over 30,000 populations in Massachusetts alone. And, and it's not like we're really helping the species that much. But what we're doing is connecting that individual child holding that individual salamander in her hand is this sort of relationship that's being formed between an organism and a person. And that is what, you know, to me is most important here. These relationships between us and the world around us. That's what I found really powerful about teaching that course. Um, and that's, you know, what this book is about. Um, so in, in the book, each chapter starts with a picture like this. And it's sort of the way the other Noah Charney would read a painting, right? You look for um, the iconography and the meaning behind Christian symbols and what that means about what was going on at the time and the painter's thoughts and all that kind of stuff. In this case, you know, we look at this landscape here and we look for patterns. And what do you see for a pattern? Well, maybe you see that over here it's dark green and over here it's light green. So then instead of looking at iconography, we go and look at the species that are there, right? And say, okay, what are all these species and what do they mean, right? There's hepatica and basswood and chestnut and, and like, what, what do I know about these species? What's their history and where do they like to live? Um, and, you know, you find that over here, there's a bunch of species that like moist soil. And over here, there's a bunch of species that like really dry soil. So then you look at the compass and you're like, okay, south, south facing slope here this is the south facing slope the sun must be up over here because we're in the northern hemisphere the sun's always in the south um so the sun beats down dries out the hill there makes this really hot dry place and that's why you have over here these species that like wait these ones all like moist and these ones all like dry so wait this compass is this is all backwards from what i said which means that it's not direction that's that's describing this pattern there's something else describing this pattern the plants are telling us a story but it's not about the compass you have to dig deeper and look at in this case the rocks and there's basalt which puts a lot of magnesium in the soil which you know makes for rich sites and rich and moist are often associated so there's this whole other story there and that basalt tells of uh, when africa and north america split apart uh 200 million years ago uh there's a junction between two different rock types, which tells us the story of not only this site and plate tectonics, but of the whole valley, this rift valley that we explore throughout the class or throughout the book. And each site we visit tells us another layer of the story of the landscape and the world. And, you know, it comes from different sources, whether they're glaciers or uh, water or fires or rivers moving around, people doing things to the landscape. We see patterns. We look at the pieces and we try to put together what is the meaning behind it and what is our relationship to it. So it's my hope and what I say is that, you know, through, uh, if, if more people have this kind of relationship and understanding of the world, uh, we'll be making decisions that are less from what I call the sort of forest of drywall and more from experience within the real forest. Uh, so I will stop there and let the other Noah take over. See if I can stop screen sharing.
Great. Thank you for passing the mic. Yeah, one of the things I like about uh, Noah Number One's book is uh, it made me immediately want to do an analysis of my own yard. And I think if any of you buy it, the first thing you'll want to do is possibly invite him over to do the analysis for you. Or <laughs> the best idea is wherever you are, you can um, uh, analyze your own yard and get to know the story behind it because you might you know, inherit or buy a house and um, you think of the house itself and you think it has a nice location, but you don't actually look at the ground around you. And and there's a story to be told there that most of us are oblivious to. And so it's a really nice thing that this book opens up your eyes to it uh, if you know how to look. So now I'm going to share my screen. And today's book that I'm going to talk to you about is The Thefts of the Mona Lisa. Um, the complete story of the world's most famous artwork. Um, so I, I sometimes will give like a 90 minute um, spiel about uh, about this. I'm going to spare you that. We're going to do the streamlined version. I just wanted you to be able to see some visuals to go with it. But um, the book is about the famous theft of the Mona Lisa from the Louvre um, uh, in August 1911. Um, but that's just part of it. That's a theft that most people have heard of. It's probably the most famous property theft in peacetime history. And it is the reason why the Mona Lisa is the most famous artwork in the world. Prior to the theft, it was among the more famous artworks. Part of that has to do with the fact that there was a real cult around Leonardo da Vinci starting back in 1550 when Giorgio Vasari, who's the godfather of art history, he was a, a Tuscan painter and architect. Uh, he designed the Uffizi, which is now a museum. Uffizi means offices in Italian. It used to be the offices of the Duchy of Tuscany. And most of our ideas about what we think of as the best art come from Giorgio Vasari, so from 500 years ago. Um, the idea of how we display works in a museum, um, the idea of a museum itself as a place where works of art are gathered and um, curated by artistic movement or the nationality of the artists. The idea that the Ninja Turtles are the best artists ever. Um, the Ninja Turtles, right? Raphael, Michelangelo, Leonardo, and Donatello. I like to quiz my students, which of the four Ninja Turtles should not be with the rest of them? Donatello, of course, lived um, uh, more than a generation before the others. The fourth Ninja Turtle should be Titian, but we're getting in the weeds a little bit here. Those are the famous four rivals of uh, the high Renaissance circa 1510. And uh, it was Vasari who said that this is the epitome of art, particularly the work of Michelangelo. I couldn't get any better than that. And many would agree with him today, but Leonardo was another subject of his fascination. Um, and so there was a huge, uh, essentially a promotional push on the part of Vasari, because his book was so influential in the centuries following in many translations, it's still a book that you will be assigned in any art history course that covers Renaissance art. Um, and because he praised Leonardo, this was one of the most famous artists in the world. And Mona Lisa is one of his great works. He didn't make many works. He uh, was far busier doing other things that interested him more. He made most of his money in his life as a military engineer. And he was also one of the greatest musicians of his era. He played an instrument called the lira de braccio, which looks sort of like a, a sitar or a giant guitar. Um, and he was uh, he was forming concerts. Um, the painting was really a sideline. Mona Lisa is a work that he believed he never finished. It was created uh, beginning in 1503 when Leonardo was quite young. It was commissioned by a Florentine nobleman named Del Giocondo. Um, who probably commissioned young Leonardo because he knew Leonardo's father, who was a notary. Um, and he commissioned a portrait of his young wife named Lisa Gerardini. But they never took possession of the picture, probably because Leonardo never considered to have finished it, and they probably never paid for it either. It remained with Leonardo until the end of his life, um, and he would touch it up. Uh, in fact, it looks like he touched it up very considerably towards the end of his life, that the original painting looked rather different, which we know from recent investigations um, by conservators using different light spectra that allow you to basically see beneath the surface of a painting without damaging it. It's sort of like x-ray vision. In some cases, they actually do use x-rays. They use things like infrared spectroscopy and ultraviolet light and various um, even more modern technologies that allow you to reconstruct 
what an earlier version of a painting looked like. Um, but he held on to it. He held on to it towards the end of his life when he was invited by the French king, François Premier, to Paris. Um, he, and he wound up living under the protection of the French king. The French king was a, an Italianophile, and he collected everything Italian he could, including Italian artists. So he invited famous Italian artists like Raphael and uh, Leonardo, Benvenuto Cellini, and Rosso Fiorentino, and they all moved to France. Uh, Raphael didn't, but the others I mentioned did. And at the end of his life, Leonardo lived um, in a castle in the south of France under the protection of Francis I. When he died, uh, Mona Lisa was among his possessions that passed on to one of his apprentices, and they were eventually bought by King Francis I. But uh, legend had it that they were actually, uh, this work and others were stolen by Napoleon during his famous Italian campaign. And this was a pretty good guess because Napoleon stole millions of works from Italy. Um, and he actually is uh, probably the first general in history. I say probably because in ancient Rome, they had this policy as well in some cases, but probably the first general to have a dedicated art theft division of his army and also to require the forfeit of works of art in exchange for a ceasefire. And this began in 1789 with um, the armistice uh, with the Duchy of Modena. And it continued, and the famous Treaty of Tolentine, which was the ceasefire where Napoleon basically said, I'm, um, I'm going to stop attacking the papal states if you surrender to me, um, that huge numbers of works of art had to be forfeited to France. Uh, the people forfeiting the works of art also had to pay for the postage of sending all of the loot back to Paris. And Napoleon transformed the Louvre from the Paris residence of the French royal family into a museum. And uh, Mona Lisa was not one of the artworks that were essentially confiscated, pillaged by Napoleon. It was already part of the French royal collection, and it was influential from the time that Francis I acquired it. He kept it in his toilette, which doesn't necessarily mean that he hung it in front of the, you know, his chamber pot in the, in the bathroom, but it was part of his bathroom suite. Um, but it was also visible to members of court and to artists. So there are copies of it by French artists dating back to the 16th century. There are also copies by Leonardo's pupils. And that's what's particularly interesting. I'm going to just skip ahead a little bit here. Um, there are copies by his pupils that were made while it was still in his studio, but before he finished making it. One of the versions is referred to as the Prado Mona Lisa. And this was a version almost certainly done by one of his pupils, but imagine he, they're sort of standing side by side working on the canvases because the Prado Mona Lisa contains pentimenti, which is an Italian word. Um, pentimenti, it's like, um, I guess like repenting something, you wish you hadn't done it. That's where the word comes from. And pentimenti as a noun means uh, corrections that are visible beneath the surface of a work of art. So these are essentially decisions about what the work would look like that change during the painting process, resulting in the painter painting over a previous version. So it might be that the hand was moved in a different position, or maybe the look was a little bit different, or maybe there was a lap dog that was added after the fact. These are changes that you can see when you excavate the surface and while um, ecology NOAA is uh, checking out, you know, the the surface and and beneath the the ground that he walks through in the forest, um, what we can do from a conservation standpoint is use these different light frequencies to look beneath the surface of paintings without damaging or scraping anything away. And so, looking beneath, we can see that the original Mona Lisa, the one that's in the Louvre Museum, has the same changes or pentimenti that are in the Prado Mona Lisa, which was done almost certainly by one of his pupils at the same time as he was painting it. So this idea that the Mona Lisa was stolen by Napoleon was uh, believed by this gentleman with a nice mustache. This is Vincenzo Perugia, uh, an Italian amateur painter, handyman, and mandolin enthusiast. He sounds like a Brooklyn hipster. And he had been hired by the Louvre Museum 
to build protective cases over certain famous works of art that the Louvre staff were worried might be attacked by anarchists. So the company he worked for was subcontracted, but that meant that he was at the Louvre and he got a Louvre worker's uniform. And he hatched the plan sometime in 1911 to steal Mona Lisa. Now, it's not clear if his intentions were entirely patriotic or whether there was an element of profit seeking, but he recognized that he had an opportunity to pull this off and he genuinely seemed to believe that Napoleon had stolen the painting from Italy and it should be back in Italy. So um, on a Sunday night, he hid in a janitor's closet overnight he waited until the next day when the museum was closed. He waited for the footfalls of security guard to pass by and disappear into the distance. And he snuck out in the early morning light and he zipped across from the closet where he'd been hiding overnight to um, the Salon Carré, which is where the Mona Lisa was displayed. He removed it from the wall and he removed it from a wall in a way that didn't require a lot of banging around, which should have been a clue for the police that he, rather the thief, knew how the painting was hung because it was hung in such a way that you had to move the frame um, in a certain pattern in order to lift it off of its hooks without clanging it around. Um, it was in his cumbersome frame. He brought it to a service stairwell. He removed the poplar panel on which the painting was made from its ornate gilt frame so it would be more portable. Discarded the frame and wrapped the painting in a white sheet. And then he headed down the service stairwell to try to exit the Louvre through what's called the Court of the Sphinx and out to Quai de Louvre, which is the road that goes along the back of the Louvre and then across a bridge and then disappear into early morning Paris. But as he reached his hand out to grasp the doorknob that would take him into the courtyard, he twisted it, but it was locked. And he thought this might be the case. I'm sure he was totally freaking out, but he did bring tools with him. And he first thought about removing the door from its hinges by unscrewing them and decided that this would make too much noise. What he did try was unscrewing the doorknob, thinking this might release the lock. And he unscrewed the doorknob and put it in his pocket, but the door was still locked. And then he heard footsteps coming down the stairs towards him. And who did it appear? Well, it turned out it was a janitor on the nightly rounds who I guess didn't think it was too unusual for someone in a Louvre worker's uniform to be locked in at night. In fact, it happens not infrequently. And we don't have any register of what he thought of the Mona Lisa shaped package wrapped in a white sheet that was under his arm. But the janitor unlocked the door, possibly commenting on the absence of the doorknob, who knows? opened the door and out Vincenzo Perugia went and he disappeared into early morning Paris and the only witness was someone who was setting up their shop across the street where there was a shopping arcade who thought it was odd that someone came out of the Louvre in a worker's uniform with a white package under their arm and then threw something over their shoulder as they disappeared into early morning Paris and police later recognized that what had been thrown over their shoulder was a doorknob. So not to tell you the whole story here, but Perugia wound up keeping the Mona Lisa for about two years. There's some suggestion that he might have thought to try to find buyer. He had a list of wealthy Americans uh, that was found in his apartment, um, but he probably recognized that there was no way he would be able to pull this off and he also later claimed that the Mona Lisa cast a spell on him. It was a sort of reverse version of Stockholm Syndrome. Stockholm Syndrome is where a hostage falls in love with their captor. In this case, the captor fell in love with the hostage. And he claims that he recognized he was engaged in unhealthy behavior. He would never leave his apartment. He'd come straight back from work. And he kept the Mona Lisa in a false bottomed shipping container under his bed. And he would just take it out and stare at it. And he was sort of wasting away. And finally he made, uh, forced himself to pack it up and he smuggled it in that false bottom shipping container and traveled by train from Paris to Florence. And when he arrived in Florence, uh, it was two years after the Mona Lisa theft. And there had been a 
huge media sensation around it. In fact, it was the world media news until the Titanic sank. And that was when it knocked it off of the top of, um, of the, the charts among news headlines. And it was a field day particularly for liberal Parisian newspapers and magazines pointing to the fact that the conservative French government couldn't even hold on to their most valued possessions. But here's where we get into a little side story. So this guy is Pablo Picasso. And on the left, you see uh, Bateau Lavoir, which is um, a sort of squat that he and some buddies lived in, probably like a, a frat house circa 1904 in Paris. That was his first studio. And he moved from Spain um, and he was very charismatic, very talented, but he hadn't really made a name for himself. Um, he was painting things in his blue period, like the guitarist, which you're probably familiar with. Um, and he hadn't yet developed cubism with George Brock. And his best friend was this guy on the left, Guillaume Apollinaire, which is the French name of a Polish poet. And they were large in life characters, probably lots of fun to be with, men about town. They were often photographed um, uh, together at hip bars like Rosary de Lila, um, drinking champagne in Kiev and having a great old time. And they were the center, central members of the artsy crowd uh, circa 1906, 1907 in Paris. And here's how they got involved in the Mona Lisa scandal. There was a secretary to Apollinaire, basically like his personal assistant with the great name of Honoré Joseph Géry Pierre. And he was a Belgian con man and compulsive thief. And he was stealing regularly from the Louvre. He was stealing it from Louvre so often that his girlfriend at the time once remembered him saying, honey, I'm going to the Louvre, do you want anything? And she thought he meant he was going to the shopping arcade alongside the Louvre, but he meant he was going into the museum. This was at a time when the Louvre had over 400 rooms and 200 security guards during the day. Um, but, you know, if you were clever, you could avoid them. There were no alarms at the time. And most of the objects were just hung on the wall, not locked there. And sculptures were kept on tables or on plinths, not inside glass vitrines. And in 1906, there had been a special exhibit of Iberian statuary. So this was ancient statues from uh, the peninsula where you could find Spain and Portugal. And Picasso, being Spanish, felt like these were his roots. And he was particularly taken with two statue heads, which you see here. And these two, to him, looked like an ancient answer to where modern art should go. And they have a cubist element. They're sort of large blocks indicating the eyes and the hair and the nose and the lips. Um, it's not realistic. It doesn't have to be because photography had been invented and photography relieved the burden of being realistic and capturing history from painting. It freed painting to do things that photography couldn't do, things like minimalism and abstraction. And Picasso loved these two statues heads. And then these two statue heads were stolen from the Louvre in 1907. And they would appear in the first masterpiece by Picasso, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, considered the first modernist artwork, also in 1907. Uh, they are thought to have directly inspired the faces of some of the figures. Now, here's where the two stories meet. After the Mona Lisa was stolen, Géry Pierret, who had been fired by Apollinaire, wrote a letter to a Paris magazine complaining that some guy had stolen the Mona Lisa and that he had been thinking of doing that and now he couldn't and this just wasn't fair play at all and now we wouldn't be able to steal things from the Louvre anymore. And he was a known associate of Apollinaire and Picasso. So the police were totally baffled. In fact, they interviewed Vincenzo Perugia twice and twice dismissed him as a potential suspect. Um, they went over and arrested Apollinaire and Picasso and they brought them in for questioning. Picasso was so terrified that he claimed to have never seen Apollinaire before, and the two were best friends, socialites who are often seen together in Paris. Why was he so scared? Well, according to Fernand Olivier, his girlfriend at the time, um, all of his art collection was kept out in the open at his house, aside from these two statue heads, which he kept in a sock drawer hidden away. 
And as soon as he was released by the police, because he was innocent of the Mona Lisa theft, he and Apollinaire put them these two statue heads in a suitcase and went out in the night and were going to throw them in the Seine River. Then they came back in the morning, totally disheveled, with the statue heads still there because they couldn't bring themselves to destroy these beautiful objects. Apollinaire in disguise, kind of in a lousy, you know, Groucho Marx style disguise with the nose and the glasses and the mustache, um, returned the statue heads to a newspaper that he happened to be the art critic for, um, and they were returned to the Louvre Museum. Um, Perugia showed up in, pa in Florence and wrote to an art dealer saying that he had the Mona Lisa, that he would like to return it to Florence, could the art dealer help? And if there was any little reward for his efforts in repatriating this work, well, he wouldn't say no to that. Um, and this was two years on. The art dealer thought, surely this is a hoax. But um, he said, okay, I'll go meet with him just in case. And he brought with him the director of the Uffizi Museum. And they went to a hotel and they saw this guy with a nice mustache. And he pulled out from under his bed a false bottom shipping container and opened it up. And there was the Mona Lisa inside. Um, and they tried to restrain themselves. They said, uh, can we take this to the museum to make sure that it's authentic and not damaged? He said, no problem. Um, and then the next knock on his door was the police. And he was very surprised to have been arrested because he thought that he would be welcomed as a national hero. He did go on trial and trial records have a very good uh, history of being saved, preserved. And so we know all sorts of details because we have the trial records. And he went on trial um, after quite a long time. Um, and he managed to win over the jury and the judge and argue that he was just being a good patriot. And in the end, the judge gave him a sentence that was actually shorter than the amount of time he had already been in prison waiting for the trial. So he was released immediately. Um, and that is the very brief version of two crimes related to the Mona Lisa theft. There are others in the book I talk about. It's really a one-stop book for everything you might want to know about this painting, about other versions of it, the story of Leonardo, its origins. I also talk about, uh, here's Vincenzo Perugia on trial and the Mona Lisa when it was returned to the Louvre. Um, and then there's a whole section about whether the Nazis stole the Mona Lisa. And the short version is they thought they did, but they had probably been slipped a copy and sent on a wild goose chase. So there's a, everybody likes when the Nazis are duped stories. And I got one of those for you as well. So I'm going to stop there. And uh, I hope that um, you will be tempted to um, get both of our books or any of our books. I'm, I've got to order me a copy of the insect one. I had one and I, when I moved to Slovenia, I can't find it anymore. So I'm going to get me a new one. And um, yeah, I, I guess we'll, we'll open now to a little chat between the Noahs and then Mina has some questions for us. Cool. Yeah, I guess uh, I guess we have some questions for each other maybe. Um, I, your books are awesome. I've been, you know, I've been listening to them on tape. I like to like to listen and, and uh, I guess I do. I have a couple of questions for you. I mean, let me start with one that I've been thinking about recently. So are, I always assumed you're Jewish. Are you Jewish, right? Yes, yes, okay. ethnically, but not practicing. Okay, so we're both sort of Jewish. And I always, I sort of, as I've been listening to a lot of your books, it's like a lot of it revolves around sort of Christian iconography and stuff in a lot of the, the things you're looking. And I just wonder, um, it's a sort of off the wall question, but like, how, like for me, like raised as a, you know, in this uh, world of, uh, these long Jewish tradition of this narrative of like we live in this Christian hegemony in this country and like shy away from things that are like that might like make us assimilate or lose our identity <laughs> like it, shy away from all this Christian symbology and stuff and it seems like in your books you really dive into it and that you use those as the clues to reconstruct what all the paintings mean and stuff and I just wonder how if, if you've ever thought about it, how like do you have any of that sense or is that like yeah, well, th there's a running joke. I'm not sure how politically correct it is, but um, the running joke is that art history is Jews teaching Protestants about Catholics. Okay. <laughs> and in the U.S. from World War II on, that really was the story. The most influential um, art historians um, were Jewish, people like Clement Greenberg and um, and Erwin Panofsky, and th there are loads of them. 
Um, and most of the students were, were Protestant, whether practicing or not, and the art that we were looking at was primarily Catholic. Um, I actually converted to Catholicism so I could get married in the church and make my uh, grandmother-in-law delighted. Um, and uh, you know, Catholics know how to party. Um, uh, but at the same time, uh, yeah, I grew up uh, ethnically Jewish, and actually I just came out with a book um, with Thames and Hudson for their myth series called Slavic Myths, and now they want me to write one called The Jewish Myths, so I'm going to be right. about Jew Jewish myths and, and stories, so I'm going to be diving back into that world. I think it, does, it doesn't strike me as, as funny because I'm just so used to most of the art historians doing uh, especially those doing analysis of iconography, which is the study of symbols and art, which is the part I like best, um, were traditionally Jewish. And maybe that helps because you don't have a dog in the race, as they say. Yeah. And when I teach art history, I teach as um, detective stories or visual puzzles. And that's probably why I also got interested in art crime. You can see the art object as um, uh, something that is the object of a mystery if it literally disappears. And then you can look at the content of it as a mystery um, uh, that needs to be interpreted. And the less straightforward works that usually have some sort of um, Catholic mysticism or symbolism laced into it is what I tend to get most excited about, particularly because maybe you have this with landscapes too. For iconography, there is a very finite visual vocabulary you need to learn in order to be able to interpret I'm going to say like, I don't know, 75% of anything you see in Western art museums in that tradition. And this is things like you recognize a cross as a symbol of Christianity. You recognize that a pair of keys is a symbol of St. Peter. Um, these are called hagiographic icons. So it's like a little visual name tag for illiterate people to recognize which saint you're looking at. Well, there aren't a lot of them. There's probably about 200. And I imagine if you go out into the woods, especially if you're used to the, the uh, ecological zone, like a temperate forest in New England, for example, and if you can recognize 200 species, you're probably gonna do pretty well. Um, and it's quite empowering because it's not that hard to memorize that finite number. And all of a sudden you feel like you could walk into, I can send a student into a museum anywhere in the world without them prepping anything and they can interpret what they see. And imagine you could send one of your students into a part of a forest that they've never been to before and just ha let them have at it. Yeah, the indicator species, there are certain species with narrow niches that, that yeah, tell you what the, what the land is like there, yeah. So what, I mean, why, yeah, I guess, why are we so fascinated by like seeing these clues and reading? <laughs> like, well, I, I think that this is a, a for, human trait. Just, what's that? <laughs> I think this is a human trait. I think like if I say, I've got an amazing secret I'm going to tell you. Yeah. Whether or not I do, you're going to be like, oh, really? <laughs> that sounds intriguing. And puzzles, like I even see this with, with if you look at titles of novels or, you know, nonfiction books too, if it's got secret, hidden, puzzle, riddle, cipher in it, people are initially intrigued because I think, I once called this the treasure hunt instinct. That's a made up term, but we want to have answers for things. And we want to engage in the process of figuring it out. Um, and it's very satisfying when, when you've come to the conclusion. I think that process is part of, you know, humans enjoy that. And humans are super annoyed when we don't understand something, which going back to myths, you might invent a supernatural rationale for something if you don't have a scientific one. Or you might, um, if you have a scientific one, so much the better. And we get frustrated by, you know, the, the blank space, the unsolved part of the crossword puzzle. So yeah. I'm guessing it's a human nature thing. Is that what you would suggest as well? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I feel like there's a sense of like, um, you know, like with tracking, I, I often like seeing tracks of the animals more than seeing the actual animal itself. Because it's kind of like, it's kind of like a letdown. No, it's just like, oh. Okay, no, but like when you're still following the tracks, it's like it could be anything. And maybe there's the answers to the meaning of life out there. And like, you know, like there's a sense of like, I think the same thing with like 
people with clothes on and people without clothes on. Like sometimes like having clothes on is like more interesting. <laughs> um, Usually. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's like you could just like the possibilities and like maybe there's like I the meaning of I really feel like it's somehow connected to like search for meaning in life, like thinking, hoping that there's something beyond the veil that like will answer everything and trying not to see it all at once or something. <laughs> I don't know. So here's a question for you. When I first met you, you were playing ultimate Frisbee and studying physics. How did you switch to to biology, ecology, and and the the landscape reading that's become a, a focal interest for you? Well, I I always have been. I, well, when I went to college, my plan was actually to study physics and then go on and do something outside in nature because I just like like both things, and they felt like they yeah. And I I I like studying science, but I really like being like studying physics, hard science kind of stuff. But I like being outside and and having an impact on the world. And I think like the tracking thing, it just, I kind of like fell into that line of like, again, it like attracted me as like, I almost didn't go into, like it happened just this random day that my brother had said, Victor Wooten, I don't know if you know who he is, he was teaching a course on tracking and he's a bass player. And I like went back to bed. I said, that sounds boring. And then like, he woke me up again and I was like, okay, I'll go see. And then it's just something about this, like this mystery, like, oh, we can solve mysteries. And it led me down this like, I want to track things. I want to solve things. And that just became like this way to experience nature and find connections and be, be, but yeah, I mean, I think that ultimately what I'm looking for isn't necessarily in the discipline of ecology. It's more in the experience of natural history and, and connecting. Um, so, yeah. So here's another one for you. I, I usually write trade nonfiction, which means books for the general readers um, and trying to maybe I'll read like academic stuff in preparation and then I'm kind of translating for the widest possible readership. Yeah. And you you did a lot of academic stuff and now your Yale Press book is more for a trade readership. What was it like to shift um, the audience for which you were writing? Yeah, I mean, I like I enjoy the popular writing thing a lot more. It feels more, as I said, like the writing academic papers that are going to just a small handful of other academics feels like kind of narrow and is not yeah. as much fun. Um, and, you know, I have piles of these papers that I'm not, you know, they're kind of interesting and they're fun. It's kind of like video games. You like play, you do these things, you get it just the right way and you win the paper, you win, you get the analysis. And, but at the end of the day, it doesn't feel as connected and meaningful. And so like, I, I've always looking for these outlets where you're getting to get outside, experience nature, and then bring people in and that like can understand it in a way that's broadly accessible um and uh yeah so it definitely feels a little bit like i always have to sort of like it's not really what i'm supposed to be doing for my job like it's really i'm supposed to be writing these papers and in fact the university some people here have sort of tried to discourage me from doing these books and stuff um, oh man um, yeah but uh you know it's it's uh there's a lot of support i get too um from a lot of corners um but you know there's certain parts of academia that's very much focused on like write papers, especially things that get grants for the schools, right? Which, like how many sure. papers have you written and and things that are just sort of in the public sphere are don't count as much, right, in academia. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm definitely of the mindset that we need to shift how we how we count things within academia. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about the, the outreach and the sort of moving beyond the ivory tower walls, um, yeah, which sure. I don't know, did you have that experience too in, in like, I, I was just never interested in, in writing to like peer professors. I think the academic writing is usually super boring and I get excited about the widest possible audience, which is why yeah. I do this multimedia stuff. I like doing the books, but I also do articles for popular magazines and I do the TV presenting and I host podcasts and radio shows and uh, the variety of things really appeals to me. And even like I, I write like Ted scripts for TED Ed videos that are meant to be shown in classrooms. That to me is super fun. So I like the diversity of it. And I think for the last people I want to talk to <laughs> are other professors, <laughs> yeah. uh, which is also why I, I'm a teach at university here and there, but I don't do anything full time. I'm, I'm not full time anywhere. I'm not on a tenure track because I was never interested in that. Was, that like being a pop <laughs> professor was, was fine for me. Yeah. Um, Mina, I think you probably, we could keep going for a while, but we, I think you have some questions for us, right? I do. And I think you could go on for a long time because you're both incredibly fascinating. But I have a question that I have been pondering for a while now. And this is, we talked about the sort of the intersectionality of um, art and ecology as part of this talk. And, um, you know, I'm really fascinated by the fact that climate activists uh, damage or try to damage artwork in order to get 
attention to their cause. And I'd like to hear from both of you, since you're in different fields related to both, how um how successful is that? Where does that come from? Why does why does that why does that give people the attention that they that they get? You want to go first? I can try. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, I haven't ever taken part in damaging my work on the sake of the climate. But, uh, you know, I think that I guess my first is, I mean, there's a couple, there's a lot, obviously a lot of different ways to see that and hold that, right? I mean, you know, I can understand this like burning sense of like, we have to do something. And I've been in protest for various reasons and understand that urge to scream. And, and but I think we all also recognize the like polarization of our world, like, when you scream or do something that damages something, it just, it isn't coming towards the other side, it is causing more rifting. And so, you know, in conservation biology, there's been a large shift over the last few decades in this realizing that, and in science in general, that we can't just be, and this is not directly your question, but we can't just be scientists doing our science and then like letting the public like go out and like take our results and do something with it. We have to be from the very beginning asking the stakeholders, like what questions should we be asking, inter inter involving them throughout the process. And in conservation biology, if we want to, you know, we want to pass climate laws, like we have to start with the people that are least like us to get them on board first and build coalitions and, uh, you know, incremental change and sort of like get everyone in one place together is the only way we seem to be able to make progress, even though sometimes we don't make any progress and maybe all you can do is scream and break things. Hmm. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> sort of like the 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 general sense from my perspective though is like, yeah, it's it's understandable, but maybe not 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 gonna get us where we want to go. Um, mm -hmm. But maybe it does bring some attention to something. So I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Well I mean the Mona Lisa was just attacked just a few weeks ago, right? Yeah. Yeah. That one I'm not so worried about. That's behind bulletproof glass and in an earthquake-proof box. So if there's a nuclear war, Mona Lisa and cockroaches are going to survive, and the rest of us are going to be out of here. I think that I think it's completely awful that art would be targeted um, to, in because it didn't do anything wrong. I mean, I totally sympathize with with the cause of the people involved, but it's a uh, it's totally inappropriate um, to be attacking works of art. And the, I think what happens is it actually has the opposite effect that people are looking for. So people are saying, yes, I sympathize with your cause, but you must be a really awful person and your organization is akin to, to a terrorist group that's like bombing the Uffizi, for example. So I think it's really bad news, but I wish there were another way to, to express it that wasn't destructive and especially to, to cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I hear the thing about like screaming into the void and um, yeah. Art is something that we all, you know, it's like hurting animals. You know, we immediately are like, no. So um, we do get that. You do the, that attention. I'm going to ask some of the questions from the audience and then I'm going to go back. Yeah. To, um, and we're going to go until about 315 for those people um, who are still hanging in with us. Um, so Janine asks for ecology, Noah, how best, in your opinion, do you think these very important lessons in understanding our environment should be taught? Well, we just need to get more people outside experiencing nature. I think that's a part of it. Um, and I think, you know, throughout, especially in academia, there's been just like a decrease in the number of outside teachings we do. Um, and I think, you know, there's lots of people have written books about this last child in the woods and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think getting people more experienced with nature and just more familiarity is, I think, really important. And it's it's challenging, though, as we move more and more into cities, like most of our population increasingly all lives in cities, which on the one hand is sort of great for our ecological footprint, but on the other hand means we have no experience with nature. Or Well, there is nature in cities, and there is a lot of sort of urban nature, and, and um, not to discount that, but we have less experience with some other parts of, of nature. And maybe we even within the cities, we don't have access to parks and we don't think about nature there. Um, so I think the more we can do either in our little yard or wherever we are to sort of get out and be ex experience nature, I think is to me the most fundamental thing. But I, I think, you know, investing in parks, investing in, in courses, investing in teachers that are gonna take kids outside, outdoor classrooms and, and sort of at, and within university systems, encouraging field courses and all that kind of stuff um, at all different realms. I think, you know, there's all a whole lot of different places to start, but I, I mean, I think just that it, it's everyone's individual experience is, is uh, where I would start. Mm -hmm. um, Art Noah, 
Can you compare the Mona Lisa theft to the Gardner Museum theft? What are your thoughts on that? So that's a good question. It's a big question. They're, they're both thefts of works of art. Um, Mona Lisa theft in August 1911 um, was a single work of art. Um, the uh, St. Patrick's Day 1990 theft from the Gardner Museum um, involved 13 objects that are still missing. Um, and uh, they're both superlatives. The Mona Lisa theft is probably the most famous peacetime theft of any object in history. And the uh, Gardner theft is probably the highest value theft, property theft in history, um, worth uh, probably half a billion or, or maybe more. Um, and the, the Gardner theft, is, it's, it's a whole story to, to talk about separately, but the short version is that um, nobody knows where the works are um, and all the people who knew where they are are dead now. So we're, we're really stuck. It's always a bad sign when the FBI has a, a, a press conference. Unless they're announcing a recovery, it means that they're totally stumped and are hoping <laughs> that somebody can give them a clue. So they did that a couple of years ago. They also raised the reward from to 10 million from 5 million. And um, and yeah, so I know a handful of detectives uh, chasing this down. But at this point, because everyone's dead, who knows or knew where the works are, I think we're going to find them. But I think it's like monkeys with typewriters. I think it's going to be a matter of, of luck when mm -hmm. we stumble on them. Somebody's, I said, Aunt Trudy's um, attic or something like that. Aunt um, Trudy's the number one suspect. <laughs> as she should be. <laughs> um, so ecology, Noah, what ended up happening with that road? Are people still not able to access the bridge? Yeah, no, um, I, I, ha I did get some of those pictures. I actually asked the landowner and they, they were friendly and let us go in at that point and they occasionally let and I don't I actually don't know who owns it right now I think they may still own it but yeah it's still private it's still um I I tried to for a minute tried to work with the council members to kind of like have some agreement to have some easement or something but we never never did that so it's essentially yeah just private property and up to the landowners to see if they want to let anybody visit that spot or not um and it's got yeah the big gate and stuff a little discouraging for being out, yeah. out and about, right? Yeah, I mean, and it's a, one of these things, you know, in like the, essentially the city of Nashville historically, and I think hopefully there's been shifts, but, you know, in a lot of places have this sense, they don't even, if you have land, like a park that I own and I want to give it to the city, they're like, no, we don't even want to take it. We just, it's just too much hassle unless we can like drive a road into it and like do it. They, they don't want to land, like they don't want to hold on to forests. They don't have the vision of like, you know, we just need to like protect lots of areas um, that isn't baked into like a lot of thinking. Um, and so that sort of needs to shift, I think. Wow. Yeah, I agree. Um, Art Noah, please again, what year was Vincenzo arrested and the Mona Lisa returned to the Louvre? Have you seen the TV show on PBS about the theft? Um, in 1913, he brought the painting to Florence and he was arrested. Um, I've seen various TV series about it. I'm not sure if this is a specific one that was on PBS. I also, because I live in Slovenia and I don't pay attention to the news aside from Red Sox news, um, <laughs> then I usually see TV shows like a decade after they were popular. I watched Arrested Development like two years ago and it was in 2004, I think. So I'm likely not <laughs> seeing anything particularly current. So, well, not necessarily current, but what would you think of, of all the shows you might have seen about it? What do you think is the most, maybe the most accurate? Um... The the best one for new detail, especially, was um, uh, called Missing Mona Lisa, by directed by Joe Medeiros. Mm -hmm. That one had some new information that hadn't come to light before. And it's probably, I want to say it came out in 2012, something like that. Um, and it's such a great story. Um, I know... Uh, I know Jodie Foster in 2018 optioned uh, an old book of the Mona Lisa theft to make a feature film out of it. I know that because another company optioned my previous book about it and nobody nobody wanted to do it because they figured Jodie Foster was going to do it. She hasn't started yet, apparently. So hope springs eternal. But either way, it would be fun to see a good a good uh, drama heist movie out of it. <laughs> um, okay, so Jason asks um, both of you, how do you explain the importance of what your fields are to members of the community who don't, like for people who don't care about the environmental research or feel art history is necessary? How do you, um, 
How do you describe what you do to them? Um, I'll start with you in ecology, Noah. Um, I think, well, for people that aren't, yeah, I mean, I, I think often it's just like giving them that experience of holding a salamander or seeing that creature and being like, whoa, this is really cool. Like they're really, have you ever held a spotted salamander? I don't know if you have, but like, they're amazing, like little creatures with big bulgy eyes and they're kind of like, there's something about it. So I think for me again, like often it's seeing and experiencing and like understanding that level of connection and, and inherent value that these things have. I mean, there's all sorts of like ways we value nature with like economics and intrinsic uh, instrumental values where it's like they save us this and they clean our water and they car filter our carbon and, and they like do all this work for us and, and uh, economic benefits, the valuation of species. And, and there's lots of economists who like do this work. But fundamentally for me, I think the more compelling is like just recognizing the inherent value that other creatures have and the, like they're not objects but they're sort of subjects and they have experiences and that you know seeing that and our duty to kind of caretake for them and not just own them um as for me like kind of where I move and I find more compelling um so you know I point you know to like uh Robin Wall Kimmerer's books about braiding sweetgrass that a lot of people have read and, and thinking about that way of thinking about the the land that, that we occupy Mm -hmm. How about you, Art Noah? How do you explain what you do? So, I mean, what I try to do with, with all my work is, is bring people into uh, art who might not otherwise be engaged with it. That's one of the reasons I like writing um, more popular books for the general public, including ones that, like, if you're going to buy just one book on this subject, maybe start here. So part of it is um, when we study art history, the, the art is almost the least of it. It's just a lens through which to learn about all different disciplines and um, about uh, humans in general. And so it's it's yeah it's it's like it, it's a lens rather than the um, the the final product. And it could be something else. You could learn about it through I don't know through a building or through an, a historical event. Um, but I like the fact that it's inherently interdisciplinary for the art crime stuff. If you're not someone who thinks strongly about protecting art, um, then the criminological aspect is that art crime has been uh, among the highest grossing criminal trades worldwide every year. Um, by some accounts, it's in the top three, it's certainly in the top 10. Um, and so, it, and most art crime is perpetrated by or on behalf of organized crime groups. So if you don't like organized crime groups, then, Curbing art crime, particularly illicit looting of antiquities, um, is one way to, to inhibit crime in general. Um, and even terrorist groups are, are uh, involved in art. So if you're not, a, not wanting to support terrorist groups, then protecting art is a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we go back a little bit to the intersection um, in that I think that what you've described in the last hour and a few minutes is that is really the essence of preserving, teaching, educating, and appreciating both art and nature. And um, I find that that's, that's really fascinating that two Noah Charneys are doing sort of the same thing and just in different parts of the world or in different parts of things that we are fascinated with. Um, so I just wanna go back to really quick. When was the first time you guys realized that you existed? I mean, I, I'm not sure how we figured it out. I know we met when we were both, I want to say, juniors in college. Yeah. And I, my, I was on the Colby squash team and we were playing against Amherst. And then I wrote that we should meet up if he was there and he was on campus then. But I can't remember how we first became aware of each other. You had told me at that point that that, that someone of the colleges had, had said you had already applied to that college when you went That's to... That's it, okay. And so, and I, I know that I, at some point, I guess after college, when I'd like Google myself, I'd be like, wait, what? Because you always, you know, you always win in the Google war, right? So, <laughs> um, so, so I think we became, I guess, yeah, your first book that, that launched sort of a lot of your career, right? Was when. Yeah, the first book, the only novel, which is called The Art Thief. That's yeah. what got things started. Yeah. I also, I remember looking for a Noah Charney at Gmail and someone had taken it. Was that you or is that some third party? Because when I wanted an email address through Gmail back in like the no, Minnesota I think area. I'm nature nature Noah. Yeah, no, I don't think I. So, so there's more of us. There oh, are, yeah. Yeah. like Highlander. 
but yeah. you have to meet and and fight each other. Oh my God, we should just have like a massive Noah Charney um, <laughs> Zoom someday. I'm going to go on the hunt because I definitely want to find that person in New York. You said the investment banker? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, How do you feel about the rise of Noah's, by the way? <laughs> the I mean, I think it's cool. It's just surreal. I just, because I had never met another Noah of any sort before when I was growing up, that it's, um, it's trippy, but in a good way. Yeah. It's definitely been a good way for us. So I really appreciate you both taking the time out of your very busy schedules to talk with us and doing this really, like I said, fun and different type of program, but also educating us on the importance of what you do and why we should be paying attention. So um, thank you so much for this and um, for everybody who came and asked your questions and, and enjoyed the conversation and had some very interesting comments, which <laughs> I don't know if you got to see, but um, I... Thank you. And um, I will be in touch and I hope everybody has a wonderful afternoon. Thanks, Thanks so much to all of you. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye everyone. Yeah.